My name is Carolyn Lawrence Dill, and I'll be talking with you today about some work that my research group does in gene function prediction and phenomics. I'm going to jump right into talking about what it is that we do in my research group, and that is that we work at the overlap of plants and computers. So when Ido invited me to give a seminar for this group, I suggested the title, Plants and Computers, which he says is high recall, low precision. So we changed the title. Two, saving time at the bench and in the field, predicting gene function and phenotype in crops. At Twitter, I'm IA Cornflake. Feel free to tweet about what it is that you see in the seminar today. The work that you'll see was carried out by Gokul Wimalanathan here in the middle, as well as Dennis Saradakis, Layla Fatel, Ian Braun, and Colleen Yanarella. I'm in the Departments of Agronomy and Genetics Development and Cell Biology at Iowa State University. In my research group, we work on lots of different topics, and those topics really span the gamut from genomics to phenomics in plants, as well as building community for genomics and phenomics researchers. Given that I'll be talking about genomics and phenomics, you should realize that I sort of see a holistic view of what these two topics are. They fall together, starting with a genome sequence, and I think that having a genome sequence allows us to find genes in their sequences. With gene calling, we can find the information that allows us to predict gene function. If we have gene function, then we can perhaps figure out what phenotype may look like. And phenotype is expressed in a given environment. Phenotypic variability in those environments is the basis for crop improvement. Genomics is sort of left heavy. Phenomics is right heavy. So these areas really are about having lots of information and being able to automate from the genome sequence for genomics to phenotype for phenomics. Some of the projects currently going on in my group are listed here. We're going to focus in today on predicting gene function and computing on phenotypic descriptions. Predicting gene function and computing on phenotypic descriptions is something that we do in my research group because we like to enable researchers to discover and prioritize novel candidate genes. If, for example, we have a phenotype of increased rates of photosynthesis, we can do GWAS to look at which parts of the genome may be responsible for that increased rate of photosynthesis, zoom in on a promising region, and see that there are lots of genes there. For many researchers, deciding which of those genes to work on first is a problem of prioritizing. If we have mutations in certain genes that demonstrate a particular phenotype, for example, the two top phenotypes show a leaf phenotype that relates to leaf greenness, we might think that those genes are good ones to start looking at for the phenotype increased rates of photosynthesis. For mutant phenotypes that relate to kernel color, for example, those may not be the ones that a person working on increasing rates of photosynthesis would want to study first. So in my research group, we start to associate images, phenotypic descriptions, gene functions, and information like that onto genomes so that researchers can make these good decisions on which genes to work on first. We'll talk first about predicting gene function. Gokul Wimalanathan was a student in my research group that graduated a little over a year ago. He was working in gene function not just computationally but also experimentally in Eric Volbrick's lab at Iowa State University. He described the problem this way. A pro for figuring out gene function in the lab is that it's definitive and a con is that it's slow. For computational prediction, it's fast, but it's only predictive. And what that really means is that we want to make computationally derived data sets that have pretty good quality. So 
here's how we imagine computational functional annotation to go as a general concept. Ideally, you have an experimentally characterized gene and it has high confidence functional annotations. Somehow you match some uncharacterized gene, you don't know what it does, with an experimentally characterized gene. And once you've done that matching, you inherit the high confidence functional annotation and call it a predicted functional annotation for this uncharacterized gene. In my research group, as well as those that many of you work in, we do that with the gene ontology. We're interested to improve functional annotations in maize. And part of the reason has to do with what the evidence codes that were associated with existing GO annotations for the maize genome looked like. If we look at Arabidopsis, which is a small weed that has a tiny genome that we use as a research model in plant biology, we can see that across Arabidopsis genes, the distribution of functional annotation evidence codes is across that full spectrum. In maize, at the time that we started this work, it was almost entirely automatically assigned. Here is little Arabidopsis, a tiny weed. Here's maize, which we depend on for food, fuel, and all kinds of other products as humans. We decided that we wanted that maize histogram to look a little bit more like Arabidopsis. But until we had time to get that done, we at least need to, to make sure that those automatically assigned functional annotations were pretty good. So here's what we did. We put together a pipeline that had this rationale. If we wanted ideally to take experimentally characterized genes and match those to uncharacterized genes and inherit functional annotations, at the very least, we probably wanted to throw out from the input anything that's automatically assigned because we're not really sure where it came from. So for the inputs for our GoMap pipeline, we ended up using only these evidence codes. We put together a few different methods for functional prediction. These included simple sequence similarity from TEAR, which is Arab the Arabidopsis information resource, and Uniprot. We also used domain information from InterproScan, and then we used some mixed method pipelines that came out of the first CAFA. So the ones that we used were Argot2, Fango, and Panzer. These performed well in CAFA. They were not necessarily the best performers, but they were among the best performers and they were the software systems that from the outside, we were able to use those systems ourselves. We took annotations from all three of these methods. We combined them. We removed duplicates and redundancy and created an aggregate data set. Once we generated this data set, it was important to us to determine whether the data set was any better than others that were already out there. The maze data sets that were already out there for coding genes were from Ensemble and Interproscan. The Ensemble pipeline generated the Gramine annotations and the Interproscan pipeline generated the Phytosome annotations that were already available for maize. So for maize, we took the protein coding genes, we sent them through the GoMap pipeline, and we compared to those annotations that came from two other systems. And then we evaluated with a gold standard data set that came from MazeGDB, that is the Maze Genetics and Genomics database. That gold standard is one where curators pulled the data out of the literature. So at that point, we could compare the data set. So this work is published. You can find it in Plant Direct. If you look across the three graphs of the gene ontology for cellular component, molecular function, and biological process, if we look at the proportion of genes with GO annotations, we see gramine in green, that's the ensemble pipeline, phytosome in orange, that is, uh, Interproscan, and then the Maze Gamer pipeline. On the y-axis, what you see is percentages for this top row. So 
Gamer definitely has higher coverage of the maize gene space. In fact, all maize genes got some annotation because 100% of genes were annotated with terms from biological process. Number of annotations is also higher. So each gene that got an annotation got more annotations from the gamer pipeline uh, than from the other two. And then finally, we have that comparison of quality based on F score. And that comparison of quality demonstrates that even though Maze Gamer annotated more genes with more annotations, the quality based on F score of those annotations is comparable. It's not necessarily better. So for cellular component, it was better. For molecular function, it was somewhat comparable to gramine. And the same is true for biological process. The GOMAP pipeline has been containerized and it's available for general use at GitHub. You can find a description of that GOMAP pipeline at BioArchive. Now that we have this system, we decided the thing to do was to use it on lots of different crops that needed improved functional annotations. Here are the students who did annotations of plant genomes, Go Cool, who taught Colleen and Dennis how to use the system. They also worked with Ha and Parnal and Kevin. Monocots are toward the top and dicots are toward the bottom. We also annotated a gymnosperm sugar pine. Once we had all of these genomes annotated, of course, the next thing to do was to write a paper telling people, hey, these data sets are out there and you should use them, which sounded to me like the most boring paper a person could possibly write. The person who was working on the project of getting a paper written was Dennis, who was a Fulbright student in the lab last year. So I asked Dennis, what do you think of potentially looking at whether we can use the functional annotations and do an analysis that shows how similar or different these functional annotations across different species are to each other and compare that with what the phylogenies for those plants looks like. So he tried it. What Dennis did was to take all of the go terms that were annotated to any given genome and to remove duplicates, and redundancies across the genome, meaning that the data set we were left with was all of the functions that occur in a given genome. When we took all of those functions, we were able to generate distance matrices as well as parsimony matrices for presence and absence of terms, and then use those matrices for traditional phylogenetic analysis using for example, neighbor joining and parsimony techniques. So here is some work that Layla has done when she picked up the project when she joined the lab. So Layla went into the literature and created for all of the species that we had annotated a cladogram demonstrating phylogenetic relatedness. Then we created parsimony and neighbor joining trees. To my enormous surprise, the trees that came out of those analyses were not so bad. So rooting with pine and looking just at neighbor joining on the left, what you see is that, in fact, the dicots are all together and the monocots are all together. The same is true for parsimony. However, it's not exactly in keeping with known phylogeny. In fact, if you look simply at the color distribution, the greens are not together, the blues are not together. One of the things that stands out to me is sorghum, which belongs at the base of zea, and so arrakis is peanut. It belongs at the base of the legumes rather than grouped as it's shown here in parsimony with cotton. So what we're doing currently is to figure out whether these differences are artifacts of genome quality. We're doing some resampling to get an idea of branch support on these trees. And we're progressively removing individual species to determine which genomes functions are what I would call in disagreement with evolutionary history. Early analyses point at Brachypodium, which has a tiny genome, 
and Metacago, which also has some interesting, unique biology among the legumes. Finally, we're imagining using this process as a hypothesis generator. Let me explain for a moment what I mean by that. For example, if Brachypodium and Sorghum have a disease in common, something that at different points in its life cycle, say, were to be a pest for Brachypodium and Sorghum, then those relationships we see here based on function might tell us something about how those plants respond to hosting that pest. Layla presents this work in detail as a poster on July 15th and 16th from 7.45 to 9.15 Eastern at the Bioontologies COSI poster session B. We're gonna move a little farther to the right next. I told you we were gonna talk about computing on phenotypic descriptions in plants and that's what's up. Ian Braun is a grad student in my lab that asks the question, what genes may be involved in my phenotype? Here's an example. Kernels are colored, kernels being a kind of seed. That's a phenotypic description, kernels are colored. We know of lots of genes that are likely to be involved in that, and we would like to be able to figure out which genes may be responsible based on phenotypic descriptions. So for each of these genes, we have a phenotypic description. We know that these are involved in the anthocyanin pathway and where they map into that pathway. If we didn't have that knowledge that these genes map to a specific biochemical pathway, but we just had this group of genes and a description of their phenotypes that we knew were related, we would hypothesize that these genes are involved in a shared process. The thing that's really hard about trying to figure out whether these phenotypic descriptions have any similarity is trying to figure out from the initial observation that kernels are colored, that this description for this bottom gene, pale brown seeds, due to reduced levels of brown pigment and seed coat, is somehow related. How do we assess the similarity between those two descriptions so that some system that we might want to put together would work? So for computing on phenotypic descriptions and for generating a system like that, we need to measure similarity between phenotype descriptions. Currently, this is done with manual curation. We would like to be able to do this on a large scale, so we're trying to deploy computational approaches. And as an initial step, we need to know how these approaches compare. So the way manual curation has been done in the past is to use various different biological ontologies. These ontologies are useful curation tools, they reduce data sparsity, and they help to quantify similarity. Let's go over an example of how we can use the gene ontology to come up with how similar a couple of different phenotypes may be. If our phenotype is delayed leaf senescence, then we would map to this term leaf senescence and inherit a bunch of terms that are less specific. If we wanna compare the similarity of that to early fruit ripening, then we're gonna look at fruit ripening and consider what the overlap is. A simple way to quantify that to the similarity is using Jacquard distances, where the number of shared terms is divided by the number of terms represented by each topic, and in this example, it's 0.5. So is that approach useful? The answer is yes. A group of us did an analysis based on hand curation, the approach was used to recover orthologous genes, genes in the same pathway, and genes related to similar phenotypes. The problems with the approach, that it depended on ontologies and it depended on the time and effort of human curators. Some computational alternatives to manual curation have come about in the last few years. The first approach involves automatically assigning ontology terms. We looked at noble coder. The second approach is presence or absence of words, and I'll be talking about bag of words. The third is a machine learning approach for word embeddings, and we looked at word to vec, doc to vec, BERT, and BioBERT. So how do the approaches compare? 
Each approach calculates similarity, AB, for a phenotypic description associated with a pair of genes. How predictive is the similarity score of two genes, A and B, being involved in the same biochemical pathway? Luckily, we had a data set that was hand curated from six different species. We were able to look at how these compared for each of those methods. How predictive is the similarity score of two genes, A and B, being involved in generating the same phenotype? This data set is Arabidopsis specific. On the right, you see a gray dotted line that shows random chance, and the black bar shows measurements for hand curation. We'll build this histogram as I describe to you how these other methods work. So Noble Coder was our first computational approach. It's an algorithm for matching text to ontology terms and it uses ontology term labels and synonyms. So this is our example I showed you earlier with leaf senescence and fruit ripening. Um, those gene ontology terms are assigned and similarity scores generated. And Noble Coder is shown here in purple. Somewhat to our surprise, this system seemed to generate similarity scores that were more useful for predicting shared pathways and shared phenotypes. So this method works well when terms are explicitly present. Another way to come up with similarity scores is to translate words and phrases into numbers. Natural language methods for assessing text similarity convert language to numerical factors. Uh, a first example is shown here where you see the original text on the left. The mutant showed increased sensitivity to heat shock. A vector is shown on the right. A second phenotypic description, the plants were sensitive to heat and drought stresses, also can be translated into a vector shown on the right. And because we have these vectors, we can generate similarity scores. Translating these words and phrases into numbers enables us to map these vectorized descriptions into an n-dimensional space. Here's an example. If we look at delayed leaf senescence, a similarity to a statement like, the mutants showed increased sensitivity to heat shock is fairly low, 0.232. However, the plants were sensitive to heat and drought stress, and the mutants showed increased sensitivity to heat shock, those statements map to a much closer area. Bag of words was the second computational approach that we used. It's the simplest approach to translating text to numbers. The order of words is ignored. The positions indicate presence or absence of a word. And an example looks like this. So if we have the statement, the mutants showed increased sensitivity to heat shock, we have a string of presence and absences of words. When we looked at the performance of a bag of words approach for finding similarity, we saw that its performance was even better. The third computational approach we used is word embeddings. So for word embeddings, we take sentences like, the mutants were more blank to the pathogen as input, then we run it through a neural network and we can predict what the match is for a given word to fill in that blank. That gives us a vector. Similarly, we can generate those vectors for lots of different statements, and those vectors for a given word end up having some level of similarity. We think of this as guilt by association, where the term susceptible has some relationship with the word resistance, but they're not the same. So what we see is that they have similar contexts in the training data, and so they are represented by similar vectors. So for bag of words versus word embeddings, if you look at a bag of words for susceptible, to, susceptible to resistance, the similarity is zero. For word embeddings, for susceptible to resistance, the similarity is 0.78. So the trade-off is losing explicit information at the cost of potentially gaining implicit information. Is there a benefit? We looked at two different word embedding systems, word to vec and doc to vec and it turns out they also perform quite well comparably to curation, but they're not quite as good as the bag of words model. So the primary takeaways and application here are this. For computation versus curation, automated approaches meet or exceed the performance of manual curation with ontologies. This is 
really important for trying to set up ways to compute on phenotypic descriptions in plants, primarily because we're never going to have the number of curators or the amount of money necessary to create hand curation data sets. It's scalable. These automated approaches can scale to the growing volume of text data for plant for maize and other species. And it enables us to create a system where someone comes in and they say kernels are colored and it's actually going to return to them a group of genes that have some phenotypes that relate to that. Ian has published some of this work recently in Frontiers in Plant Science. The next thing that he's going to be publishing are analyses of the approaches that I showed you today. An online resource that enables researchers to identify similar phenotypes across six plant species and an expansion across more species, potentially including vertebrate. Most of what I've been describing so far has to do with gene function that someone working as a geneticist might be interested in. Someone working with mutants that cares about what a particular gene does. There also is a need to compute on phenotypic similarity for more applied purposes like breeding. Colleen Yanarella, a graduate student working in my lab, had an idea that she would like to enable researchers that go out and measure phenotypes of plants growing in the field to discover new traits. A way that a person might imagine doing that at a very high level is to go out into a field, walk through it, and talk about what each plant looks like. Once back in the lab, similarities across phenotypes could be merged with genomic information so that association studies could be carried out. Here's the overview of the concept. A researcher goes out into the field and records descriptions of plants. That's translated to text, and then that text is extracted or translated into a specific phenotype. From there, phenotype-based semantic similarity networks are constructed, and synthetic traits are determined. This is where we look at highly interrelated descriptions and define those as synthetic or latent traits. From there, trait associations to the genome could be found. This work is only now in the planning stages. We are hoping by next summer to be able to grow a field of maize mutant plants where we know which genes have mutations and can test whether the concept of starting with recorded speech, determining synthetic traits, and detecting novel trait associations would work. In review, what I told you today is that gene function prediction systems that perform well in CAFA improve plant functional annotations, that the functions present across multiple genomes can be analyzed and potentially used as hypothesis generators, and that computational analyses of phenotypic descriptions are showing great promise. I'd like to acknowledge our funding sources, USDA, Fulbright, Iowa State University and the NSF, as well as key people that worked with us to get these analyses done. If you have questions or suggestions, I would love to hear from you. Contact information is shown at the bottom right. Thank you for the invitation. I hope some of what I talked about today was interesting.